Chapter 54 One name stood out given the number of times it appeared. It was from Star, and the name Jared appeared on the message. I think this is the call you need to make yourself. It's from someone called Star. Ida knew instinctively that this was significant. A sense of panic immediately overcame the room. Steve seemed almost paralysed. Star, she's Jared's wife. Pass them here, please. The sudden urgency led to Isla clumsily fumbling with the pile of papers immediately agitating Stee. Now, Isla. His tone had changed from a broken man to somebody with an urgent job to do. The adrenaline had returned. Paralysis dissipated as he knew he must speak to his friend's wife. The least he could do was pull himself together. The telephone rang and Stee huffed in irritation. Can you just get rid of them? I don't want to speak to anybody except Star. Get them off the phone, please. Hello? She mouthed the name Star and Stee jumped forward and grabbed the receiver from her. Star, this is Stee. I, I just got back and was about to ring you. Her tears disguised what Star was trying to say, to the point that Stee could not understand a word, but he knew instinctively what she was trying to communicate. He waited for her to calm before he felt able to tell her what he knew. Star, I don't know what to say. I've been trying Jared all day. We were together. We were there just before it happened and he went to another breakfast meeting with an investor. It was in the tower, the one that was first hit. I don't know if he made it to the restaurant. You know how things change all the time with him and what he's like. He may not have even gone into the building, gone to Starbucks instead. It was at this point that Steve lost it. The optimism that Jared had not been in the tower was enough for the tears to return. He let the phone loose from his grasp and Isla picked up. Hi there, Star. This is Isla, a friend of Steve's. Star wasn't listening. She was in as wretched a state as Steve. The confirmation from Stee that he was not with Jared was all that Star needed to know that her husband was gone. Isla couldn't do anything to help. Stee took the phone again and they cried together. The emotion of the moment was too much, even for a bystander as she was. Nothing could prepare somebody for now. There were no words, but no words were needed. Star was the first to regain her composure, explaining how she was heading over from Staten Island to search for her husband. He might have escaped the building and was lying somewhere concussed. Surely they had to try. It hadn't crossed Steve's mind to search. His confused wander towards the hotel had been enough of a struggle, but with the suggestion now out there that there was hope, however slender, he said that they would look. However pointless the search, it had to be better than doing nothing. If Jared had escaped, he would have contacted them, but there were so few working phones, this offered some hope. If he was knocked out, he would have been taken to hospitals and they'd have his ID. Any other scenario made no sense. The news channels were telling people to stay away. The tunnels and bridges were closed and the ferries were only taking people off Manhattan as the evacuation of half a million people continued. Entry to the island was limited to those officially supporting the rescue efforts. Steve broke the silence. Star, please stay where you are for tonight. Stay by the phone and wait for news. That's all we can do now. I will go to the office and check. I'll go to every bar I know Jared likes and every restaurant he could be at and I'll check anywhere else I can think of. Leave it with me. And tell me if you think I'm missing somewhere he might be. Isla and I will do everything we can to find him. Isla nodded back quietly. Steve was glad to see that she was happy to be included. Although he was trying to do something instinctively, Steve knew that it was useless and a waste of their time, but it was at least something. Steve jumped up and, with a renewed sense of purpose, pulled on clean clothes and downed a long swig of water. What about the other calls, Steve? People still need to know you're safe. Right, good point. Okay, I'll call Tina and she can deal with them. He immediately called Tina, giving her the details she needed from him to fill in the gaps. He finished by giving his boss the numbers of people who needed contacting. Only then could they go on with the search. It was Isla's idea to print posters detailing Jared's missing status and contact information, but the business lounge was packed. Too many people in the hotel had the same idea, so Steve suggested they head to his office. They could do the printing there. It wasn't late, although neither of them had registered what time it was. All time had suddenly been rendered meaningless. Isla had a message confirming that flights were grounded for at least 24 hours and she should stay put. How did you get a room in the hotel? The new crew coming in later aren't now, so we took their rooms. I don't know for how long, but I can't see us going anywhere for a while. The skies are totally shut. At the office, a couple of the team were still at their desks. Steve's arrival was greeted with an explosion of relief. It had been 12 hours since anybody had heard from Jared. No one in the office had heard from Steve all day. It hadn't occurred to him that he'd been a cause for their concern. But his team had been trying to get hold of both of their missing colleagues since the initial news where planes striking the North Tower broke. Jared and Steve were also their friends and apart from comfort breaks they had not moved from their desks. 
frantically searching by calling everyone they knew to find out what might have happened to them both. Although Tina had phoned ahead to assure them that Steve was alive, his presence in the office still came as a welcome piece of good news, a validation that it was true. Steve looked at the two piles of papers on one of the desks. They were the posters one of the team had already made up, one pile for Jared and another one with his face on it. Steve gasped, bending his knees to steady himself as he realised how close he'd come to becoming one of the statistics in this horror show. Steve tried to make light of his own wanted poster, joking about the picture they'd used. No one needs to see this picture. I look like a deviant. They'll be slapping me with an exclusion notice from the local schools if this gets out. But when it came to the other pile of papers, he picked some of them up and ushered all the team into a circle where they could hold each other close. The emotion of the last few hours fed into an energy and nobody spoke until Jackie, the PA who had known Jared since their office had opened more than five years before, asked for a moment's prayer. They held hands and begged for God's help. The possessors of faith and no faith paused as one, united in hoping good came from bad, God or no God. They broke from the huddle, divided the papers and agreed who would go where. Steve and Isla headed to the village while Jared's deputy Devon went as far south as he could get before heading back north. Steve asked Jackie to call Star and let her know what was going on, but to stay in the office and field everything that came in from their base camp. She should call Tina and involve her. He knew she would now be through his call list and frantic for news on Jared, who, like all her closest staff, was as much her friend as her colleague. The office was littered with promotional bottles and packets of sweet that acted as crappy giveaways to visitors. Filling as many bottles with water as they could carry in one of the rucksacks lying around, Devin, Isla and Steve set off in search of news, however hopeless a task they had to try.